powerful thing. To ensure the safety and the freedom that we are guaranteed to worship as we see fit and to worship openly and freely in this great country of ours. Um, that is the whole reason that this country was formed Amen. was for religious freedom. Amen. We will not bow to terrorism. We will not bow to tyranny. We will not bow to crazed individuals that want to take that right away from us. No, we will stand proud before the cross and we will kneel and we will worship as we see fit Amen. in this great country. So that's my rant for the morning. If you will take your uh, bulletins and look to the left-hand side this morning, uh, we're going to go ahead about a week or so early and say happy Thanksgiving to everybody. We're glad you came today. We have got tons and tons of food in the back, uh, probably enough to feed everybody here and probably take some home with you for dinner this evening. Um, hint, hint. So uh, <laughs> we're glad you're here. Uh, everybody, welcome. I would love to every Sunday see this place filled to capacity, uh, a blessing of the Lord that in the last year this church has grown. Amen. We have welcomed wonderful, wonderful new members, and uh, we, uh, we appreciate your attendance and, and your attention here in the house of the Lord. Our ongoing ministries, back uh, in the foyer, we had the WMU Greenhouse Ministry, uh, where we are bringing uh, clothes, especially for the winter time. I noticed we've got a couple of full boxes back there. Probably in the next week or so, we'll bring these forward. We will bless them. We will send them out into our community uh, to be used by the, the uh, needy and the homeless here in Grayson County. Uh, we have almost 3,000 homeless people right here in Grayson County. That's just the ones we know about. That is a larger population than White Wright, Texas. So we have an entire city of homeless people right here in our own community. And this, along with the Grand Central Station, is a uh, mission project we choose to uh, participate in on an ongoing basis. And this is something that goes out into our own community. We can see the results of it with our own eyes. Oftentimes, we give offerings that go overseas or they go across the state of Texas. And oh, by the way, Texas won yesterday. Um, uh, I had to throw that out there. They got beat last week. Anyway, but we can see the results of this ministry with our own eyes. We can see the results and we can see the smiles on people's faces when they have daily necessities provided for them that we take for granted every morning. Uh, we don't have to worry about getting up and going out into the cold and being cold. We have coats to put on. We have gloves to put on. We have boots that we can wear. Um, if you have a boot collection like Dina, then uh, the Lord has greatly blessed you if you have a boot collection like Dina's. So, uh, But this is something we choose to participate in. Uh, I believe that our efforts are blessed and these people really appreciate these small daily items that we take for granted. So please, let's uh, let's keep that in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, let's see, our roofing fund, I know as of this morning to replace the portion of the roof that we are sitting under right now, we have at least uh, $955 toward our goal. We're not exactly sure what the goal is going to be yet, but I have a feeling it's going to be somewhere between five to six thousand dollars. So we're about, uh, say, a fifth of the way there, which uh, is going really, really this well. I've been longer than that one, over sir. There. This this area is a little longer than that one over there, but. and steeper too. Yeah. So we'll, we'll we're we're there. going to say at least six, yeah. and uh, hopefully the Lord will bless us like he did on this other portion of the church that we got done. Uh, the gentleman that did this portion of the church was very uh, competent and understanding in our situation. And we were blessed to have him work on uh, this part of the, the roof for us. Uh, I have looked at it for what that's worth, but that's what I do for a living. And uh, it did a really, really good job on it. I was really pleased with it. So our insurance fund, uh, we are paid up and prayed up 
through about February Amen. of this coming year, but uh, we already have a good $108 at least beyond that for our monthly goal of $218, very attainable goal, very manageable insurance goal for the church. Um, we were blessed with a brand new policy, uh, less than half of our monthly premium used to be uh, for better coverage. So this was a true blessing from the Lord. And it seemed like when that happened, things just started falling into place for this church. Uh, when we got that new policy, uh, we got the new policy. We got the roof taken care of. We've got new members, uh, some of them with a wonderful boot collection. Uh, <laughs> I only pick on you because I like you. Okay. So uh, anyway, uh, things have started falling into place for Twin City Baptist Church. It's a true blessing, and uh, we expect great, great things in the future. Uh, next, uh, that would be Saturday the 18th, November 18th, at the Dorchester Baptist Church. It's going to be uh, Sean Bensley is going to be teaching a uh, luncheon program there. Uh, the Grace and Baptist Association leadership team will furnish lunch. We encourage you to all come be a part of that as we have great fellowship here in this wonderful holiday season that's starting. They're already playing Christmas music on the radio. Amen. Can we at least get through Thanksgiving? Anyway, but welcome to everybody here today. Let's all take a hymnal, turn, stand together and turn to number 361. Coming to his house, gathered in his name to worship him. We have come to his house, gathered in his name to worship him. We have come to his house, gathered in his name to worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ the Lord. Let's forget about ourselves and by His name and worship Him. Let's forget about ourselves and by His name and worship Him. Let's forget about ourselves and by His name and worship Christ the Lord. Worship Him. Amen. You may be seated. Let's uh, turn over in your handles now to number 132. For our 
offertory hymn this morning. Let's all stand and turn to number 256. Spirit of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again to bring us together in this place at this time, and our hearts are filled this morning with the joy and the victory of Jesus, the opportunity we have to lift him up and to worship him, to know the power of his presence within us through his Holy Spirit. We ask now you'd bless this time of giving, blessing both the gift and the giver, and instilling with each one of our hearts the power, the purpose, and the devotion to use it for one single purpose to bring men, women, and boys, and girls to know Jesus Christ. Amen. And for us to realize this morning above all else that we are all a product of someone else's mission effort, someone else's prayers, someone else's message. Yes, and so we want to go forward with that in our own lives to the lives of others. Bless us now in these moments and forgive us of our sins in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. wise poet once said roses are red violets are blue Dana's going to come sing <laughs> you know I work all week on that from God to you what? <laughs> yeah from God to you amen see even your dad said amen good morning everybody how y'all doing? Boy, there's some people in this house this morning. God bless every one of you. I've said many, many times, and I'm going to say it one more time because I talk a lot. That's just what God told me to do. So, I, you know, I got, to, I got to do what God tells me to do. I'm not a singer. I'm a bringer. And I'm just bringing you what he told me to. So that's what it's about. If you don't like it, uh, we'll sing, sing a different one next week. Y'all come back and hear that one. <laughs> Go. 
some folks may doubt some folks may scorn all can desert and leave me alone but as for me away but since that day yes since that hour God has been real cause I can feel his holy power yes God is real he's real in my soul yes God is Turn me off, aren't you? Oh, okay, then. Well, no, 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 no. Uh, this week, let's have silent prayer for the families of the victims of last week's tragedy. When the bulletin was made this week, I got a bonus. Let me explain it to you. It says, lunch begins at 12.15. <laughs> Which I would take that to mean that I get to preach to 12.14. I'm only kidding with you. I thought I saw that this morning. I thought, that's kind of a great opportunity. I need to take advantage of that. <laughs> What we'd like to ask you to do this morning is take your Bibles and I want you to go to the book of Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. The horrific events of this past few days tell us a great deal about the prophecy of God and when God tells us and directs to us the situations. I want to begin this morning by helping us to grasp and to understand God's position and our position before God. And our position before God this morning is in the third chapter of the book of Romans and in the 10th verse. As it is written, that's in God's word, there is none righteous, no, not one. We, once we understand that, once we understand that we have a sin debt upon us, 
that we can't do anything about within ourselves. Your goodness doesn't work. Your kindness doesn't work. Your morality doesn't work. Your efforts don't work. None of that will take away that sin. And so once we have that, we need to understand the position we have before Almighty God. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. We could look all day long, way into the night, and we never find an individual this morning in and of themselves that were righteous. Amen. But we only have only to look, perhaps, hopefully within the mirror, to see one who has trusted Christ as Savior. Amen. And we are the righteousness of God in Christ, according to Scripture this morning. In verse 11, it says, There's none that understandeth, there's none that seeketh after God. And man left to his own devices will not seek God. He will seek pleasure. He will seek lust. He will seek the lust of his eyes. He will seek the normal, natural things of the world. And because that's his direction and that's his creative position. And so the Bible says in the 12th verse, they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. That's to God. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. I remember many years ago of hearing the story of a man who went to India to be with Sister Teresa. And he got over there and he got to the orphanage and he said, I've come all the way from America. He said, what can I do? What can I do to help you? What can I do to help these people? I, I want to come here to serve God. And she says, go get a broom. And he said, what? She says, go get a broom. He said, ma'am, you don't understand. I've come all the way from America. She said, I'm not sure where you came from, but go get a broom. <laughs> well, what am I going to do with the broom? She said, sweep that next classroom. Mm -hmm. Think about that this morning. For him, that was humblest service. Amen. For him to get a broom and go sweep a classroom. Amen. But that's what God would have you do. Humblest of service. God, there's not always a pretty place for us to go and serve God. We have a wonderful young lady. Our church has studied about her for years. Serves in the Brantley Center in the heart of the drug and alcoholic district of New Orleans. And we pray for her, this young lady every week for her protection, for her safety. But, you know, she doesn't feel in jeopardy there. She says, I'm where God asked me to be, doing what God's asked me to do. And I'm here rejoicing in that opportunity. We find the Bible says the reason people are the way that they are let me show, describe these people to you, see if you don't know some of these people or you've been around them this, this week. Verse 13, their throat is an open sepulcher. Their tongues have the used deceit. The poison of asp is on their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. We saw that a few days ago. Destruction and misery are in the way, in the way of peace they have not known. No man knows peace. No woman knows peace until we know Christ as our Savior. Amen. It's an inner peace, not an outer peace. In our world, there'll never be an outer peace, you see? But we'll have an inner peace. That peace comes from our living relationship with Jesus Christ. The 18th verse said, there's no fear of God before their eyes, and that's our problem today. In our world, men do not fear the Creator God. Amen. They do not fear the God who gave His Son to die for our sins. They do not fear God in any way. They are, many times they would tell us things like this. You know, I think we're kind of like dogs and cats and squirrels and birds. We live out our days, we die, and that's it. Well, I hate to inform them about that, but that's not it. That's just the beginning. The time we spend here is a beginning. The time we spend in eternity is a, eternity. It's a long time. And the Bible says that uh, there'll come a time. Let's look at verse 19. It's a real great verse. Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to those that are under the law. But you know, we don't live under law in this morning. We live under grace. When Christ died upon the cross, the law was over and grace began. The Bible says that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now, the Bible talks about the fact that even Abraham, while God gave him a covenant law, his faith was of righteousness, trusting God's word for the future, accepting God's prophecy, looking forward to the Messiah, not the little lamb he was going to sacrifice this next time the Passover came, not that bullock or not that anything. He was looking forward to Jesus. The Bible says in Romans, the 23rd verse of the third chapter, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And sometimes we don't like to think about the fact that we ourselves fit in verse 23, but we do. 
We fit in verse 23 because we don't have another verse right now to fit into until we come to know Christ. We are justified freely by His grace. Amen. Now notice that. It's the gift of the grace of God by which we are justified. Justified means to be made just as if you never sinned. See, the moment we trust Jesus as our Savior, all of our sins from the moment we were born to that moment are sealed by the blood of Christ and washed away. So then that moment, we're just as if we had never sinned. I wish I could say we'll stay like that forever, but we won't. But our soul is already sealed. It's sealed the moment we trust Christ. And we cannot, again, commit a sin unto spiritual death. But we can commit a lot of sins in the life of the body that we have to live in. And so we need to lead, let God lead us through that. We're freely justified by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There's redemption in nothing else. Amen. Every sacrifice of that Old Testament ritual had no power in itself, only as it related to Christ who would one day come and die for our sins. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, there's that old $10 word, which means a substituted payment through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. God allowed Him to die for our sins. In verse 26 it says, to declare, I say at this time His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Now if you don't believe in Jesus, your sins are not justified. If you don't believe in Jesus, your soul is not sealed by His Spirit. If you don't believe in Jesus, your name's not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And we'll cover that here in a little while. Now, God's Word concludes to us the things we have to do. Look at verse 28 very carefully. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, which are the works of men. Amen. Isn't it wonderful that you don't have to work for your salvation? Amen. <laughs> you know, that'd be terrible, you know. Because as lazy as most of us are in this world, we'd want to get off early. And that'd get us in even more trouble. So I'm glad we don't have to work out our salvation. If we did that, we'd all be missing heaven, but we'd all be gaining hell. Now, if you turn over a page or so in your Bible there, to the fourth chapter and the seventh verse, blessed are those whose iniquities or sins are forgiven and whose sins are covered. That's by the blood of Jesus, if you're a believer. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin because we believe in Jesus. Those sins of mine have now been laid on Christ. Amen. The sins of you have now been laid on Christ. He bears those sins. He paid for those sins with his very life. And we're cleansed from that by our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so the Bible tells us that we have to understand a few things. I mentioned this a moment ago. I'll read it to you again in verse 13 of the fourth chapter of Romans. For the promise, that's the covenant promise of God, that he should be an heir of the world made to Abraham, was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. They believed and trusted the word of God that there would come a Messiah. And that Messiah would pay for our sins. Messiah's blood would cleanse us. Messiah would make us right with God if we trusted in Him. So they were looking a long way past that, you see. Now I used this verse last week. I'm going to use it again today. It's verse 17. He's speaking about Abraham. I bade thee, a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth, which means made alive the dead, and called those things which be not as though they were. God and God only can do that. He knows the future. God calls the things that are not yet happened as though they've already happened. Amen. And that's a great thing for us as believers today. We need to learn to do that. We need to learn think daily about, I'm going to heaven to be with Jesus. Yes. We need to think every day about the fact that as we serve the Lord and love the Lord and participate in the things God has for us to believe, that we would be strong in our faith. Let me read to you about verse 20 of that fourth chapter. He, Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Amen. Unbelief will keep you from trusting God's Word. Unbelief will cause you to put value in yourself instead of putting value in Christ. But he was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded that what he had promised, that's God had promised, he was able to perform. Isn't it wonderful God can do that? Every time I think about resurrection, I think about the fact that as Jesus rose one day, I will rise and you will rise as a born-again believer. Amen. And that the grave couldn't contain him, it won't contain us. And so 
we as Christians have two birthdays. We have a physical birthday and a spiritual birthday. The lost world has a physical birthday only. And so when it comes time for judgment, all they'll have will be the physical life in which they'll have to pay for the future of eternity in a place called hell because they've rejected Jesus. Now, look at verse 25. Who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification to make us just as if we'd never sinned, totally, perfectly cleansed of our own sins. Amen. And what an opportunity that was for us. Amen. Romans 5 and 12 says, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. See, sin brings death by its very nature. Okay? It brings, first of all, a spiritual death to an unbeliever. You and I were once spiritually dead who know Christ this morning as Savior. Spiritually, we were dead. We are in our sins, covered by those sins, anchored by those sins to an eternity called hell. And then we met the Master. See? And the Bible tells us then that uh, we have to understand He was delivered for our offenses. Before God this morning, you and I, the moment we trusted Christ, were as pretty and clean as the new-driven snow. Though our sins were as crimson, they'll be white as snow, the Scripture says, in the marvelous prophecy of Isaiah. Now, Isaiah lived a long, long time before Jesus was here. But his message that he spoke was the message I read to you about a while ago. God knows how to speak the things of the future as though they were now. Yes, sir. So we must look at what God says in the Bible as, being as our relevant daily acceptance of the Word of God. Now, he tells us this. Verse 19, For it is by one man's disobedience, Many were made sinners. The day that Eve took the fruit of the tree that she wasn't supposed to and induced Adam to follow her, and he followed her by choice. He made his own choice. We were all made sinners. Think about this. As God drove them from the garden, put angels with flaming sword at the entrance so they couldn't enter in again and eat of the tree of life and live forever in their sins. What a wonderful day it was when God took that opportunity away from us and from them. But when Abel came along, he was a child of sin. When Cain came along, he was a child of sin. And as they grew up, one of them chose God. Abel served God. And he brought God the best of his flock. And he sacrificed that innocent animal to show what? The innocent Christ who would one day die for the sins of the world, Amen. whose blood would be shed to cover all sin. Cain brought I honestly believe the best of his field. I think he brought the best grain and the best fruit and the best of everything. But that doesn't meet the requirement of God. God said without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. You can't make wheat bleed. You can't make your fruit bleed. You can't do that. He brought the wrong thing. And he brought it for the wrong reason. And the Bible said he rose up in the field one morning and slew his brother. Now, if you don't know how connected God is to you this morning. God said to Cain, Cain, where's your brother? He said, am I my brother's keeper? And God says what? Yes. yes. Are we our brother's keeper? Yes. There's people out there you know today who are lost and without Christ and it's your job to make sure they get to know about Jesus. Amen. Now you cannot save them. I cannot save them. The church cannot save them. The Baptistry Waters cannot save them. But the blood of Christ can. And they have to know that. He says, As by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one Jesus shall many be made righteous. Now, I want to read to you chapter 6 of Romans. I want you to follow carefully with this because this tells a great story about baptism and why we baptize. Now, man asked one of my Methodist friends, asked me one day, he said, Why do y'all go to all that trouble? to waste all that water to get all those clothes wet and use all those towels to get dry have to bring a change of clothes to church with you just so you can say I baptized all of them I said you just said it we want to baptize all of them what did Jesus do did he die partially for you no completely baptism is a picture of being put under the blood of Jesus who wants to go under the blood of Jesus with your head hanging out? Or your arm hanging out? Or your toenail or fingernail hanging out? I want to be completely covered. Amen. 
That's what washes away my sins. I don't need a handful staying there. I don't need a shoulder staying there covered in sin. I sure don't want my head there filled with sin. So we baptize. We completely immerse. Let's look at this sixth chapter. Verse 12, uh, 3. Know you not that many of us as were baptized into Jesus. Now we're not baptized by Jesus. We're baptized in the name of Jesus. But we're actually, actually baptized into the experience of Jesus. Christ dying for our sins. His blood flowing over us. Completely covering every sin. Taking every sin away. And giving us the opportunity of relationship. We were baptized also what into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Amen. You're different than you used to be. Now, I wish I could say this morning we'd get prettier. I wouldn't even mind being a little tremor. But notice something. It's not an outside experience. It's an inner experience. See? When your sins have made you free, you are free indeed. Your outer shape has nothing to do with that. And so I heard a man say one time, he don't look like a preacher. Preachers don't look like anything, folks. We come in every size there are, every color that there are, every language that they are. But see, so many times we make that outer judgment. What does he tell us about the Savior? He had no beauty that we want to choose him as our Savior and as our Lord. He wasn't strikingly handsome like the Van Dyke painting. You look at that Van Dyke painting of Jesus outside the door, and the first thing you say, that's a good-looking guy. <laughs> Long, flowing hair, prominent cheekbones, tall. looked like nice, tall, and nice and trim, when he actually probably wasn't very tall at all. Every generation gets taller. And I we were in a shopping center the other day, and I pulled up to this car, and, and, and I looked at this car as I pulled in, and it had a big old sign there that says, Tall Gal. Well, in a few minutes, she came out and got, of course, she was tall. That was good advertising. But I would venture to say if we went back in her ancestry, she didn't have a lot of tall people before her. At some point, they began to get taller and taller. We're supposed to we get taller and taller every year as a generation. Now, because we know that, what do we see happening? We should walk in a newness of life, not the way we used to act, not the way we used to talk, not the way you used to perform, but in a newness thing. Amen. Knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him. The Bible says he took my sins and nailed them to his cross Amen. to be covered by his blood as it poured from his back and poured from his brow and poured from his hands and poured from his feet and then poured from his side. Now the Bible said, he that is dead is freed from sin. That's dead to sin because you believe in Jesus. If you be dead with Christ, we believe we should also what live with him. He didn't stay in the grave. What did he do when he got out of the grave? He continued to witness. He continued to preach. He continued to teach. He continued to strengthen. That's what we want to do. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more. Death has no more dominion over him. From the moment Jesus was born, he was under death. From the moment you were born, you were under the death sentence. Death is our destiny. But he wants our destiny to be challenged by faith in Christ. The Bible says death hath no more to be over him for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth what? Unto God. As a believer, you're living unto God this morning. Likewise, reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive through God unto Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, Roll over another page or so with me there. I want you to look at the 17th verse of the 6th chapter of Romans. But God be thanked that you were the servants of, that ye were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Our doctrinal statements we stand and say every single Sunday morning. And you might get tired of that. Never. But what's it saying? These things I believe. This is what my God stands for. Amen. You know. We do believe in the virgin birth. We do believe in the resurrection. We do believe in the blood of Christ. We do believe in the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. We believe those things. They are the foundational principles upon which we have built our life in choosing Christ as our Savior. Being made free from sin, we become the servants of righteousness. Now, all of us have worked at one time or another in our lives. Okay? Look at verse 23 of the Romans chapter 6. The wages of sin is death. That God put it in a way that we would all understand it. 
You work so many hours at such a rate and you get paid on payday. Okay? As a believer this morning, our greatest payday will come on resurrection morning. Now we know it's going to come because we've trusted in Him. He said, if I rise, you'll rise also. But think about what it's going to be when we get to resurrection morning. And we see the validation of every single solid thing we've ever believed about Jesus Christ. Amen. And the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I want to mention something carefully to you about verse 23. The gift of God is eternal life to every soul, believers and non-believers. If you read that verse and don't grasp that, you might think, well, gosh, we have eternal life through Jesus Christ. The rest of them just die and go away. No, they have an eternal life too. Our destiny between birth and death is to make a decision about Jesus that determines where we spend eternity. Yes, who we spend eternity with. And the comfort or the pain of eternity. Now the Bible says in hell, there'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. The Bible says there'll be fire without ending. The body will burn, but it will not cease to burn. Now, ladies who cook a lot, or men who cook a lot, it hurts a little bit just to get a spatter of grease on you, doesn't it, when it's warm? Can you imagine your whole body being in that situation like that? Larry, brother-in-law over here, had a serious accident in the garage, and you were sitting in the fire, weren't you? He was sitting in it, and he was burning. And I'm sure he could tell you tragedy stories about the pain this morning and the suffering of that. It was many, many months. Uh, we, we went to see him the night he was burned in the, in the hospital, and it was terrible. But something, can you imagine the whole body being like that? Can you imagine burning from the top of your head to the bottom of the soles of your feet, and there was no way to get it put out, you know? There was nothing to cool it. I remember you telling me about the time that when they take you in for therapy and put you in the water tub, that's rough, wasn't it? He said it was just like being on fire again. See? And then they take you out and get you all fixed up and get the salve on you and wrap you all up. And then they say, do and do it again tomorrow or the next day. See? I had a bad stasis ulcer one time and the guy went in there. It was a real large. Matter of fact, the doctor told me to get go in the hospital and take my leg off. And I said, I don't think so. And it was probably about as big around as the top of my watch and probably about that deep. And he said, you will never save it. I've never seen one that big cleared up. And so I went over to get the guy to do the first treatment that I wanted him to do on it to see if we could save my leg. And of course, God did that through his uses, but he took a vegetable brush and stuck it. It went, and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm holding on to the table and shaking like this, you know, <laughs> sweat's pouring out all over me. And I'm doing this, you know, and biting on some claws and putting a story. And then he said, hang on a minute, I got to pour some alcohol in that. <laughs> and then he put salve in it. And then he wrapped me from my toes all the way up under my leg, under my knee. And you know something, folks? I never missed a day's work. I had this funny looking sandal on it. It was a big old dude. But I never missed a day's work. But every other day, we got to go out and do that. And every day, I got to look forward to that, like you got to look forward to that, that bath that's coming, put down in that whirlpool, you know? And you think, compared to what we went through in pain, and he went through in suffering, and many of the others did many other things too, think what it'd be like in hell. I had a hope that at some point, we'd stop that process, and things would be better. He had a hope that we'll get this finished and I'm going to be better. But in hell, there's no promise of that. And there's no hope of that to ever get any better. See? So, the ways of sin is death, the gift of God, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's where we get that marvelous gift of a spiritual life. Now, if you look over in chapter 7, the Bible says, Paul is talking to the church at Rome. Let me read you a little bit. This is what Paul's daily life is kind of like. And I'm going to begin in verse uh, uh, 21. I find a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Did y'all ever start to do something and it just got sidetracked? That's what Satan does. See? You know, I mean, that's what Satan does. That's his job. And he's good at it. Okay? Uh, one time we were out at the parent. Uh, housing base one time uh, me and our pastor I was our pastor when I first came to Twin Cities and uh, we were out there talking to a couple and the lady she said you know she said my husband used to be president of the principal superintendent of Sunday school and said I taught class and we did this and we did that and I'm just sitting oh I'm a young guy I'm excited about the things of God and and and, and so finally he said uh, she said well said we, we just had gotten started back in church since we got here 
And so I thought, man, they must have just got here last week, you know. And I finally, well, he said, well, how long have you folks lived? She said, 11 years. <laughs> you know what that is? That's what Zig Ziglar said his grandma's biscuits did. They got cooked in a squat. Mm -hmm. They squatted down, never rose to serve God anymore. And they never came. They never came. They never got started again. They had knowledge. They had teaching ability. They had the blessing of God on their life, but they didn't get started. They got cooked in the squat. They squatted to rise, but never made it. And so we find that in a lot of people. Now, chapter 8, verse 2, the law of the spirit of life is capitalized, Holy Spirit of life. In Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and the law of death. That's spiritual death, not physical death. Christians will die because we're supposed to. These old bodies only last so long. They don't come with an expiration date. Okay? So we don't know when. Tragically, a few days ago, many's lives were taken that they probably thought they'd live to old age. People with those small children probably thought they would grow up and see them go to school and, and grade school and preschool, middle, uh, middle school and high school and maybe college. And they look forward to children and grandchildren. They look forward to long relationships, but they did not have it. Why did they not have it? Because we live in a world of sin. Okay. Evil is all around us today. It's not on a distant hilltop. It's not overseas. It's right here at home. Yes, and we're going to see more and more and more of these things happening because of the nature of the world in which we live today. Amen. I was talking to one of the men at work the other day, and he's a veteran. And he says, what they do with young men now when they bring them into the service. First of all, let me tell you this. Until you become desensitized to what life really is, it's hard to take a life. Most people today with a carry permit, they've got a gun to carry, they're legal, they were trained. When they're confronted, many times people freeze at the thought of taking a life. They might get the gun out, but they don't get the job done because they got to take a life. So they desensitize these young men by having them watch hundreds and hundreds of hours of people being killed till they got to the point that it's not a big deal anymore for their survival. He said in, in World War I and in World War II, many times the, the GI would not fire the gun until they were so close enough and sometimes they even got bayoneted by the enemy because they just didn't want to take that human life. But you see, you have to step forward from that. Tragically in Dallas many years ago, a young man was robbed in front of a prominent restaurant and a man demanded his money with a gun and he put, pulled out his gun and did this twice and nothing happened because he forgot to take the safety off. And he died right there on the street with the gun in his hand. And the sad part is all he had in his pocket bill for was 40 bucks. He died for $40. Now think about that. The man said it best in the commercial about the, the horrible storm in South Texas. I saw it again yesterday evening twice. He said, you spend a lifetime accumulating and building a life, and in one night it's gone. But the lady behind him said, but we're alive. We're alive. That's what's important this morning. You might lose everything you have. House, cars, money, clothes, for everything's gone. But if you're alive, you're okay. And if you're a Christian, you're really okay because you know the Lord Jesus. Now in verse 8 of the 8th chapter it says, They that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Holy Spirit. If you be that that Holy Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ, What? He is none of his, and that makes you what? An enemy of God. Man told me one time, says, well, I'm not against God. I just don't believe in God. Well, to not believe is to be against, you know? That'd be like if I said, I don't believe in gravy. <laughs> By the way, I do believe in gravy. <laughs> but that's a position of a, a you're, at a, you're at odds with something when you don't believe, you know? Right. You don't believe. And I many years ago, had a new automobile. We were leaving to go to church, and we were driving down the highway, and it was pitch black, and the old country road, and I was running pretty fast, probably 75, maybe 80, and because I'd been over the road hundreds of times, and we had one of those new cars that had those little doors that dropped down by the, they come up, you know, when you turn the switches on, the little doors went down. Do <laughs> you know how far you can see when that light goes off? <laughs> I couldn't see that. I couldn't see this. It was pitch black. And I got on the brakes and finally got stopped, and I was a little edge of the ditch, but not over him too much, and I got out. 
and I couldn't get them things to come on and off. I couldn't get them to come up. So I found me a stick and I propped them dudes up and I took it into the service department the next day. The guy said, you know, he said, you're in this mess because you don't have enough knowledge. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, there's a switch right over here. If you'd read the book, he said, if you push this switch in case that goes down, they'll go back up. <laughs> now, I was in the dark, wasn't I? But what about the billions of people who are in the dark about Christ? There's a book here that tells us which switch to push. There's a, there's a message here that tells us who to believe in. There's a message here this morning that tells us what we can do to get ourselves out of the mess that we've gotten ourselves in. Now, I want you to take your Bible and go to Romans chapter 8, the last part of the of chapter beginning in verse 26. I want to tell you something about why you want to have a, a relationship with Jesus Christ through faith. Likewise, the Holy Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. And sometimes we don't know what to pray for. We want things to be better. We want things to change, but we don't know really how to express that. It says the Holy Spirit itself will make intercession for us. He'll get the job. He knows our hearts and he'll talk to God about the things that we need that we can't even utter, the scripture says. Okay? Now, think about something. Once we have had an opportunity to hear about Christ, to know he died for us at Calvary, to know he rose for us on resurrection morning, to know he walked among us for 40 days, preparing the hearts of those innermost circle to spread the gospel all around the world. And then he ascended one day back to glory with the promise to come again, that where he is there, we may be also. I want you to notice this morning, I'm going to tell you why our world is like it is today. Let's take your Bible, look at Romans chapter 10. We're going to go down to verse 2. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to the knowledge. To knowledge. For they are being ignorant of God's righteousness, going about to establish their own righteousness, and have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for the righteous to everyone that believes. Our world is filled with people today trying to do their own thing, not God's thing. See? We have so many false teachings and so many isms and so many cults out there. It's just amazing. As I've told you so many times, you can know you're involved or talking to a cult member when they start talking about you getting lifted up, you becoming important, you becoming this. The Bible says he must increase and I must decrease. Christ is the answer. Amen. And the answer is service. The answer is love. The answer is power. The answer is service. And that's what God would have us do today. Now, chapter 13, Romans chapter verse 1. And I will be through before 1215, I promise. <laughs> Let every soul be subject to higher powers, for there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. God has allowed Satan to be running rampant among us today because it fits the plan of God. We have to choose Christ for ourselves. Nobody can do that for you but you. It has nothing to do with your color or your language or your ethnicity, or your background, or what side of town you live on, has nothing to do with any of those things. You might be rich and you might be poor. On my computer, this, on my phone this week, I have a little thing, a little app there. It's called a Fortune Cookie. And it'll come up with a little Fortune Cookie. You tap the little thing, and it has a little saying come on there. Now, I like the one I had this week. It said, you know, money will not buy happiness, but it's better to cry in a Porsche than it is on a bicycle. So think about that. It won't buy money, but if it won't buy it, then let's go someplace where it is. Now, let me tell you a sad thing this morning. Romans 14 and 11. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Now, if we didn't have to do that this morning, things would be a whole lot different. But we do. And God has records today. Recording angels. They record everything you even think the Bible says. Thoughts and intents of your heart, God already knows that. And they, they record and record and record and record. You know? And I have searched my Bible. I can't find where they have any erasers. <laughs> See? They have no erasers, but you have an eraser when you confess your sin to God and ask for forgiveness. Then God takes it out of the way. Takes it out of the book. They can record, but they can't erase. We can do, but we can ask for forgiveness and receive forgiveness. I'm going to close with you this morning, the book of Revelation, chapter 20. And we're going to go there to the 11th verse. 
<clears throat> this is John writing as God carried him and showed him that future he could speak so positively about because he knows the future. The devil that, it says, I saw a great white throne, it's verse 11, him that sat on from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place. There's no place to hide from God. Amen. No place. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged out of those things was written in the books according to their works. That translates as choices. What kind of work you do, what you choose to do. And then notice this. Last phrase, verse 13. They were judged, every man according to their own works or choices. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. There's a second death. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was what? Cast into the lake of fire. The one thing most people don't ever think about, maybe they've never been told this, but at judgment, there's no altar call. At judgment, there's no, there's no invitation. Amen. There's no second chance. Amen. The marvelous prophecy of the Old Testament says it's the point of man wants to die and after that's a judgment. Amen. If you're going to get the job done, you've got to get it between birth and death. Yes, sir. And that's all, the only time you got to get it done. So when we think about it, what we have at knowing Christ in our own lives and what it can mean to other people if we share what we have with them and invite them to join us in trusting our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as our personal Lord. And it's a really difficult thing to do. It's a tremendously difficult thing to do to trust the Lord. Let me read to you how difficult it is. This just boggles my mind that it's this difficult. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shall believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I think that's pretty simple. Jesus, I can't make it anymore by myself. I want you to help me. Amen. I can't take care of my sins. I need to let you put them under your blood. Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life. Because I've messed it up enough by myself. I need help now. Amen. And call upon Jesus. It's just that simple. that simple. And the scripture says, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. We live in a time today when so many people in the church are literally ashamed to admit to people that they are born again Christians. Amen. And we got to change that. You see? God's word calls for bold soldiers, not timid, shaken souls. Amen. The Bible says put on the whole armor of God Amen. and go forth. And that's what we're supposed to do. <laughs> but if you think last week was bad, wait till the coming weeks. 26 people died in that event. 3,000 died in the towers. And all over the world, they're dying today. Last week, I believe the reporter said yesterday, there were 32 people shot and killed in Chicago, which has the strongest gun laws in the country. Amen. Guns do not kill people. Knives do not kill people. Sharp sticks do not kill people. Rocks do not kill people. People kill people with rocks and sharp sticks and knives and guns. <laughs> You can go home today and load your weapon and put it on the thing and take the safety off and lay it on the table. And as long as it lays on that table and you stay away from it, it's not going to go off. It won't kill anybody. You know, it won't kill anybody. And in a gun store, it doesn't load itself either. It doesn't hop off the rack, go over and pull open the drawer and load itself with a shell and then fire. Somebody has to do that. Man is the problem, not the gun. Yes, sir. You know. And so once we realize today that things are not going to get better, you know, I get to thinking sometimes when we come to the church, we're supposed to talk to people about things are going to get better. They are. They're going to get a whole lot better. But it's a different kind of better. Amen. You see, as long as we're in this world, we're going to have heartache. We're going to have sorrow. We're going to have poverty. Jesus said, you'll always have the poor with you. Some days I think, why we should just be able to solve this poverty problem but we can't because the Lord said we'd always have the poor with us. And all that comes about because we live in a sinful world. And there's only one answer. Amen. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open that door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. We must open the door. Amen. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I invite you to trust Amen. Jesus. If you're here today and you're a believer, I invite you to say to the Lord, I want to do a better job today, starting today, than I've ever done before. And let's just march forward together in Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for coming together in this place with us and to bring each one before us today. We thank you for the wonderful gift of Jesus. And we just pray this day that you would look upon us with favor and forgive us of our sins and speak to our hearts by your spirit in this moment of invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with us, please. 296, 294. <laughs>
Lord Jim, would you lead us in a prayer of closing as well as the blessing of the food? And in gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. We just thank you for all the blessings that you bestow upon us from each and every day. We just ask that you would be with the families that lost loved ones in this terrible tragedy in Sutherland last week, dear Lord. We just ask that you would comfort them, look after them, and guide them, show them the right ways to go. We would ask that you would bless the food, let it nourish our bodies, look after us, Amen. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Now today, what we want to do, all of our visitors go first down to the dining hall, through that door to the left and down the bottom of the hill. Except the workers.